not lie to Parliament. Facing more questions today about exactly what he knew of the controversial Downing Street drink stew, the PM apologises again and pleads ignorance. No, nobody told me that what we were doing was, as you say, uh, against the rules, uh, that the event in question was something that we were going to do something that wasn't a work event. Also tonight, an end to Scotland's Omicron restrictions, but Nicola Sturgeon urges caution. They're back. Radicanu and Murray stormed through the start of the Australian Open. And... The floor didn't even make no, like, crunching noises. Please, miss, there's a crocodile under the classroom. The surprising tale of the reptile in the Ronda. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. Boris Johnson insisted today that he had no idea a Downing Street drinks party during the peak of the first lockdown had been against the rules. Speaking to the cameras for the first time in six days, the Prime Minister categorically denied that he'd been warned the party breached regulations. His former aide, Dominic Cummings, though, insists Mr Johnson was told and says he is prepared to go on oath to prove it. Well, not okay, as the Chancellor gave his backing to the increasingly embattled Prime Minister. Here's our political correspondent, Daniel Hewitt, with the latest. The Prime Minister is still standing for now, but the pressure is piling up, and so are the questions. A week after apologising for attending a Downing Street drinks party he believed was a work event, he faces new accusations. He was warned it was a party beforehand that would break COVID rules, an accusation he today denied. Categorically, categorically, that nobody told me and nobody, nobody said that uh, this was something that was against the rules, that was a breach of the, of the COVID rules, that we were doing something that wasn't a, a work event because, uh, frankly, I don't think, uh, I can't imagine why on earth it would have gone ahead or why it would have been allowed uh, to go ahead. I, my, my memory of this event, as I've said, is going out into the garden for about 25 minutes for what I implicitly thought was a, uh, a work event. The idea that you walked into the garden, there's 40 people there, the tables are laid out with food and drink and there's alcohol yeah. being served in the middle of a lockdown and you think that's a work event, that is just ludicrous, isn't it? You are just taking the mickey out of the British people by no, suggesting No, well, I, I, look, I, I... You know how silly that sounds, don't you? I think what people need to do is wait and see what the, the report says. But I, I repeat my, my deep apologies to people for mistakes that uh, may have been made on my watch. And there was the first public apology to the Queen, who sat alone at her husband, Prince Philip's funeral, the day after two other parties were held in Downing Street. The Prime Minister hung his head before responding. I, I, I deeply and, and bitterly regret uh, that, 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 that that happened. And I can only uh, you know, and renew my apologies both to, uh, to Her Majesty and... Uh, to the country. But that interview has done little to quell Tory anger. Among this group of Conservative MPs elected in 2019, we understand more than 20 have met to discuss plans to remove Boris Johnson as leader. And tonight, his former aide, Dominic Cummings, confirmed he'll give evidence to Sue Gray's inquiry and tell her he personally warned the PM that the party on May 20th would break lockdown rules. Today, we asked the Chancellor where he stood on all of this. Do you believe the Prime Minister? Of course I do. The Prime Minister you set out. The truth. Of course I do. The Prime Minister set out his understanding of this matter in Parliament last week, and I'd refer you to his words. If the Prime Minister lied and lied to Parliament, he should resign, shouldn't he? Well, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. The ministerial code is is clear on these matters, but as you know, Sue Gray is conducting an inquiry into the situation. I think it's right that we allow her to conclude that job. And you support. Thanks, and, very and much. you support the Prime Thanks. Minister unequivocally.
But crucially, does Boris Johnson have support among voters? It didn't look good for him at this party shop in West London this afternoon. Apologies aren't enough. Absolutely not enough. He needs to go. No, I don't believe him. I think he'll, if he had a chance, he would do it again. Nobody has any respect for Boris anymore. This is the problem. And tonight, there are plenty of Tory MPs wondering the same. Daniel Hewitt, ITV News. And our political editor, Robert Peston, is here. So, Robert, what did you make of it? How he performed today and how he answered those questions? Well, it was one of the strangest interviews I've ever seen by a Prime Minister. Um, we all know that booze plus sausage rolls, as I've said to you many times, equals party. Um, and he just repeatedly said multiple times, nobody told me that this event was against the rules. Now, I struggled to find a single person in the UK in May of 2020 who didn't know that parties breached the rules. Now, there could be, as I've said before, under the work guidance for those doing essential jobs, there could be a sort of legal lo loophole because the, 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 those guidelines didn't say no parties. But that's because those people who drafted those rules took it absolutely for granted that there would be no parties. So, Almost everybody I've spoken to, including lots of his MPs, think that what he said today was simply incredible. And I'm afraid I've spoken to other Tory MPs, I'm afraid for him, as it were, who say that they no longer have confidence in him and they will be sending in letters. Okay. Which means, basically, they want him to go. OK. Robert, thank you. A man has gone on trial for the unsolved murder of six-year-old Ricky Neve more than 25 years ago. James Watson was aged just 13 at the time of the alleged attack in 1994. He denies murdering Ricky, who was found strangled near the housing estate in Peterborough, where he lived. Martha Furley has more. Six-year-old Ricky Neve disappeared after leaving home for school in November 1994. His body was found by police the next day in woods just five minutes from his home in Peterborough. He'd been strangled and left naked. A day later, his school uniform was discovered in a wheelie bin nearby. Two plastic toys and some cards were in his jacket pocket. 40-year-old James Watson appeared at the Old Bailey today accused of his murder. He was just 13 at the time Ricky was killed. The prosecution alleged that in November 1994, 13-year-old James Watson was exhibiting a grotesque interest in the subject of child murder generally, including things he said to his own mother. The jury were told two witnesses had seen Ricky and Watson together playing truant on the morning of the day he disappeared. But due to what the prosecution describe as an error, the court heard the police investigation at the time focused on Ricky's mother, Ruth. She admitted cruelty, but was wrongly accused of the killing and was later cleared by a jury. It was only when the case was reviewed in 2015 that new scientific techniques matched DNA found on fibres from Ricky's clothes two decades earlier to James Watson's profile. Watson denies murder. The trial continues. Martha Fairley, ITV News, at the Old Bailey. ITV News understands the British man who held four people hostage at a synagogue in Texas was known to MI5. Malik Faisal Akram, who was shot dead by police during the siege, had been under investigation in late 2020. He was assessed as not being a credible threat to national security. Now, Scotland is to lift all COVID restrictions brought in over the Omicron variant. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said from Monday, large indoor events would resume, nightclubs will reopen and social distancing regulations would be shelved. The changes will be brought in on Monday after a significant fall in COVID infections. Now, detectives have arrested a man on suspicion of murdering 23-year-old teacher Ashling Murphy in the Republic of Ireland. Ashling was attacked last week as she was out for an afternoon jog. It has sparked renewed calls for an end to violence against women and girls. As Rebecca Barry reports, news of the arrest came as family and friends attended Ashling's funeral. In their school uniforms, they're too young for this. to say goodbye to their teacher, murdered last week. 
Ashling Murphy described as a shining light. Her death has shocked not only those here in County Offaly in the Republic of Ireland, but beyond. Among the hundreds at her funeral mass this morning, both the Irish president and Taoiseach. Mourners told the depraved act of violence raised questions about society's morality. Hours after her funeral, police confirmed that a man has now been arrested on suspicion of her murder. The man in his 30s is being questioned by officers. The 23-year-old primary school teacher was killed on the banks of the Grand Canal outside Tullamore last Wednesday. It's thought she was out exercising when she was attacked. The murder has once again sparked calls for more to be done to tackle violence against women, vigils held in many towns and cities. This morning, the priest said Ashling Murphy's family had been robbed of their most precious gift and spoke of the need to evolve and bring change. Rebecca Barry, ITV News. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, it is a double whammy down under at the Australian Open and how an ageing crocodile became an unexpected school pet. Those stories and more after the break. Join me then. Welcome back. Last night, you may remember, we reported on the desperate situation in Afghanistan, where millions are on the brink of starvation amid economic collapse after the Taliban takeover. Billions of dollars in aid is being held up by fears the country's new government will divert it for their own use. In the second of his reports from Afghanistan, our correspondent John Ray travelled to remote rural areas where they know even if help does come, they will be last in line. There is a timeless side to Afghanistan, resistant to change, resilient in crisis. But this is a test of their deepest reserves. Shafika has her winter larder stored underground. The difference between eating and starvation. This is all we have, she says. Much of this vast land is cut off. The big freeze follows the worst drought in 30 years. During the long war, this village and so many more like it really were in the front line of the conflict with the Taliban. But now they are at the back of the queue when it comes to help from the international community. There is here absolutely no peace dividend. The Taliban wants international recognition. It wants aid, but it wants it all on its own terms. Couldn't you solve this crisis almost straight away by guaranteeing women can go back to education? That would be the clearest indication that the Taliban is committed to human rights. In respect of women's rights, we never prevented anyone going into education or the workforce but it must be under the framework of Islamic principles. A middle class who once fared well under the old regime now struggle. In Kabul, they queue for food. We have um, uh, teachers, doctors, engineers who work in the previous government and uh, now they lose their jobs and they are vulnerable to have the food assistance. They've got nothing but what yes. they can get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah waiting for their sack of flour and single bag of beans is a woman who tells us her daughter was studying to be a doctor and then the Taliban closed her school. The boys still get to sit exams even if it is outside in the snow because their school building is a wreck with no heat or light. They can dream. My goal ambition in the future a uh, uh, good uh, doctor for us uh, people. This little girl can only watch and wonder what might have been. However deep the crisis, the Taliban will recast this country in its own image. John Ray, ITV News, Kabul. 
And to watch more of John's eyewitness reporting from Afghanistan and to find out what you can do to help, head to our website. That's all at itv.com forward slash news. Now, new pictures have revealed the scale of the damage caused to Tonga by a volcano and tsunami. Aerial video shows the main island covered in ash. Its government says the region has been hit by an unprecedented disaster. Three people are confirmed to have died, two local residents and a British woman. Here, Together Energy has become the latest supplier to collapse due to the surging price of gas. It was part owned by Warrington Borough Council. The regulator off Gem will move the company's 176,000 customers to a new provider. And Microsoft says it plans to buy the company behind the popular video games Call of Duty and Candy Crush. The deal, more than £50 million worth, will turn Microsoft into one of the world's largest video game companies. Workers have suffered an effective cut in their pay packets. Despite rising wages, official figures show that rocketing inflation has cancelled out any gains that might have been made in pay. That comes as millions face a major cost of living crisis in the weeks ahead. Our economics editor, Joel Hills, is outside the Treasury tonight. So, Joel, the Chancellor's under real pressure here, isn't he, to help. What can he do? There are, and there are sounds of an emergency as we speak, Mary. The fact is that we don't know what he's going to do, yet he will have to do something surely, because what we've seen is though financial support avoided mass unemployment right at the beginning of the pandemic. It has created a squeeze on living standards, uh, one that began at the tail end of last year, one that looks set to last for much of the year ahead. The good news is that the number of people on company payrolls at the, uh, during the month of December rose well above uh, pre-COVID levels, despite the emergence of Omicron despite the end of furlough. There were also more than one million vacancies across the economy, a record. Although many firms still complain they struggle to recruit. And here's the kicker, real average earnings began falling in November. It's official as prices rose faster than pay. The in-work feel worse off and the Chancellor is under pressure to do something. This is a global phenomenon because the, the causes of inflation, whether it's supply chains or energy prices, are of course global in nature. But we are taking action to support people best we can. That's why, for example, the national living wage is going up, putting an extra £1,000 in people's pockets. The Chancellor there talking about what he's already done. He's under pressure, make no mistake, to go far Further, energy bills rise in April. Tax rises that Rishi Sunak introduced also bite. These changes will hurt. They'll hurt the poorest the most. OK, Joel and the Treasury, thank you. Well, there has been a double success for Brits in the Australian Open. First, Randy Murray marked an amazing comeback with a five-set victory on the same court that he believed his career had ended. And Emma Raducanu made it through to the second round. Garrett Vincent watched the action. The last time Andy Murray played tennis on this court, one of his hips was causing him such terrible pain, it almost forced him to retire. Three years later, and he's had the hip replaced, and he's back playing at the very highest level. The big hitting Nicholas Basilashvili provided the new joint with a thorough test. But it passed with flying colours. And Murray, who was. It took five sets for the Scotsman to secure the win and at the end he was, understandably perhaps, quite emotional. I've played on this court many times and had the atmosphere is incredible. I've always had fantastic support and yeah, this is the one where I thought potentially I'd play my last match on three years ago, but amazing to be back winning a five set battle like that. British tennis has another star now, of course, and she was shining too. Emma Raducanu faced top draw opposition in her first round match, but the quality of her shot making saw the 19 year old through against the American Sloane Stevens. So it was a good day down under for Britain's champions, old and new. Geraint Vincent, ITV News. 
And finally tonight, the crocodile under the classroom sounds like something from a children's story, doesn't it? But it is an unlikely reality for pupils at one primary school in the Rhonda Valley. The saltwater croc in question is thankfully quite harmless as it's been dead for more than 100 years and it has now become something of a celebrity, as Chloe Keady found out. He's not exactly your average school pet, but the students at Uzgol Bodringacht are very attached to him. It turns out he's been part of the fabric of this school for more than a hundred years. They just didn't know it. And all those lessons that you've had in here before, and you didn't even know? Yeah, the yeah. floor did, did you? The floor didn't even make no like crunching noises. While they were up here learning history, there it was lying right beneath their feet. I couldn't believe it. I just was so shocked. I thought it was a dream. I can't imagine anyone else could say they found a crocodile underneath the, the classroom floor in their school. He's probably one of your sex's greatest memories. There had been rumours about a crocodile lurking beneath the classrooms, but no one really believed them until 2019 when some builders doing renovation work discovered its dusty, decaying remains. Experts have spent lockdown cleaning and reconstructing it. Why do you think it ended up under the floorboards? We aren't exactly sure, to be honest. The story might be to do with the fact that in World War II they wanted to keep things safe. It might just have been a case that they'd had enough of it and thought, what better than put a crocodile under a school floor and threaten the children to behave. Legend has it that a soldier who travelled the world after serving in World War I brought this back as a souvenir for the local school children. Now, more than 100 years on, it's inspiring the next generation of historians and scientists. I think they've came from part of the leg. They already have lots of questions, but their first job is to come up with a suitably snappy name. Chloe Keady, ITV News in the Rontha. Well done, Chloe, had to be said, didn't it? And uh, that's it for now. Tom's here at 10 from me and all the team. Bye-bye.